Well, I, I got to be honest with you. you. You guys are unbelievable. I just, I, I'm so amazed by what you do. I've been at several of the workshops and main sessions, and I'm hearing about villages where every child, be, because of the work you do, every child is going to school. Or every farmer has enough to eat with their family. Or, or their houses being built for people who just a year ago had no houses. I got to tell you, as a wannabe missionary, I'm, I'm kind of envious of what you guys get to do. I am an unrepentant adrenaline junkie, and I'm hearing your story just going, that would be so cool. So on those days where you feel like, man, nobody's listening, and this is really hard work, and I have a lot of opposition, just know, right here at Christ Church of the Valley, you got a lot of fans, we applaud what you do, and we're, we're honored to have you on our campus. And I'm not just uh, envious of you, I'm a little bit, <laughs> here's the honest truth, I, I'm a little bit intimidated by you. Because like, here I'm standing, and, and I'm trying to talk to you about how to do ministry that you're doing in, in, in unbelievable ways. And I don't know, that, honestly, I don't know that I have a lot to offer you. And you might think, oh, you know, that's just blowing smoke. No, no seriously. The title of my talk is, so send I you. But you guys are the ones that are already doing that. Now maybe I could add this. In that statement of Jesus, in, uh, in John chapter 20, it was the night before, or the, the, the night that he rose from the dead. Jesus said to his closest friends, so send I you. The so is not thus. It's not thus I'm sending you. Or not therefore I'm sending you. It is in this way I'm sending you. As the Father has sent me, in this way, in this manner, I'm sending you. And I think the holistic missions movement gets that. That the ministry efforts that we have on the mission field should mirror the ministry accomplishments of Jesus during his life. And the same kind of things that, that he addressed himself to, the poverty, the, the sickness, the, the community development, those are the kinds of things that should be important to us. But seriously, I'm supposed to know this stuff but I don't know that I do like you. Now, let me prove it. True story. Four years ago, I'm at a mission conference kind of like this one, and somebody came up to me, and I'm the Bible teacher, so I'm supposed to know Bible things like, you know, John 3, 16, the Great Commission. Somebody asked me this simple question. What does it mean? Matthew chapter 20, and I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. What does it mean when Jesus says, teaching them all the commands, to keep all the commands that, that I have taught them. What, is that, what does that really mean? And I said, well, obviously, it's the two great commands, to so love God, love people. That summarizes it. And this guy, he goes, no, I'm not asking what the summary is. I'm asking, what are all the commands? And in my erudition, I said, I don't know. I never thought of it before. And I didn't like that, so I went back home and I looked up all the red letters and looked at all the commands. Do you know there are 110 commands in red letters in your Bible? Jesus said 110 things that you're supposed to do. And I started to categorize them, and this blew me away. Look at category number one. Follow me. 40 of the 110 are simply follow me. He says it in various ways. Listen to me or be with me or watch me. But it was almost as if the major command of Jesus is just be with me. And by being with me, absorbing my company, then what flows out of you, the work you do, will flow correctly from you. Second command is about religious piety. Things like prayer, fasting, almsgiving. The third command, about money. Certain things you should do with your money, so says Jesus. Fourth command. And it's mentioned, like 22 different commands, Jesus commands us how to treat people. Specifically, widows, orphans, prostitutes, tax collectors, Samaritans, Gentiles. We have quite a few of those commands. And the last command is about preaching and persecution. That is, Jesus said, go make me famous, and you're going to get beat up for it. That's a command. And I, I thought to myself, I wonder if I could catalog all of those through the book of Acts. Because like, we actually have a document that tells how well the early church did keeping Jesus' commands. Well, it's easy to find preaching and persecution texts, right? 17 out of the 28 chapters of Acts have somebody thrown in prison or beat up for preaching Jesus. Easy. It's also easy to find people following Jesus, especially if you count obeying the prompting of the Holy Spirit, which I think is like, I don't know, the same thing. Third, you have religious piety. 
And there's lots of passages in Acts that talk about prayer and fasting and giving of alms. There's passages that deal with money in the book of Acts, how the church gave to their own poor and took care of each other or took offerings for uh, the poor Christians in other geographic areas. That, that much is all clear. But look at the fourth command down, treatment of others. We're thinking about Jesus eating with tax collectors. When did that happen in the book of Acts? We're thinking about Jesus caring for prostitutes. When did that happen in the book of Acts? We're thinking about taking care of orphans. When did that happen in the book of Acts? We're thinking about taking care of widows. Well, that's chapter six. We finally got one. What impressed me about this list in the book of Acts, especially in light of what you people are doing in this room around the world, that may be the only constellation of commands of Jesus that we're actually doing a better job today than the apostles did in their day. Is that unbelievable? Like what you're, what you're calling people to, what you're empowering people to is to fulfill all the commands of Jesus in a way better than the apostles. I find that pretty exciting. And in fact, I would, I would make this proposition that following Jesus mandates holistic missions. You can, if your mission efforts don't mirror his ministry accomplishments, it's not hardly following Jesus. And from the beginning to the end of his ministry, remember the, one of the first sermons Jesus ever preached, Luke 4, hometown synagogue in Luke chapter 4. He, he opens up a passage from Isaiah. You know it well. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor. And he said other various things like giving sight to the blind and releasing prisoners. But the bottom line is, for Jesus, if your gospel message is not good news to the poor, it's not the good news of Jesus Christ, because that's what he started with. Salvation for Jesus encompassed the whole person. He was Jewish, after all. Shalom was economic, it was spiritual, it was sociological. I, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but hang with me here. The, the actual word for salvation that Paul uses is a Greek word, sozo. It's the same word to describe Jesus' miracles. So when he cast out a demon, it was sozo. When he raised the widow's son, it was sozo. When he took a woman who had been bleeding and brought her back to her family and community, that too is sozo. It is as if Jesus does not know how to love part of you. He doesn't know how to care for your soul and not also care for your physically embedded condition. And I think that is, that, that is a holistic missions mindset that has been kind of burgeoning over the last few years. It is a relatively new movement in which we are in modern days accomplishing things that were not even accomplished by the apostles in their day. And, and Jesus at the very tail end of his ministry, I mean the last night, looks across the table at his disciples, John chapter 13, and he says to his closest friends, by this they will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Now we're all on the same page with that. Fair enough? Can, can I hear you? Yes? No? I mean, like, you agree. That, that's why you're here, is that you agree. My question to you this evening is not what does it mean, so send I you. My question this evening is, who is your you? To whom you will say, so send I you. In other words, it took us a long time to get here where we strategized to use the giftedness of the entire body of Christ, the medical community, the economic community, law forces, and, 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 and legal strategies to, uh, to make real transformation in villages, villages so that Jesus could be famous all over the world. It took us a long time to get us here. Will we sustain that in the next generation? Now, I understand that uh, there's some students from Arizona Christian University here tonight. Are, are you here? Uh, the, the overwhelming. Um, so if, you are, if you are 18 to 29 years old, just stand up in here for, for just a minute because we want to make fun of you. Uh, there, there you are. No, thank you for being here. I, I, I applaud you guys for being here. Now, you guys standing up, look around and, and look at the boomers and busters in the room. These guys uh, have built some incredible ministries, and they want to pass it on to you. Is that possible? 
your, your natural response is probably, oh, yeah, man, I've talked to some of these guys. Of course, it had to be at Starbucks over a latte, but you've, you, you've talked to them face to face, and you go, we want to we wanted drill wells in Africa, and they go, oh, yes. Oh, yeah, we're, we agree with that. Like, that many of you have fought the battle, and good for you. You fought the battle in your churches to get people to finally realize that preaching the gospel of Jesus is not antithetical to uh, women's literacy. It's not antithetical to uh, sustainable farming practices. It's not antithetical to some of these social concerns. You fought those battles, and then you turn to the millennials who just stood up, and you go, you got to agree with us, and they're going, dude, we, yeah. What's the, what's the debate, right? Here's the problem. They are less like you than you think. And here's why. You boomers and busters are compassionate. In fact, some of you are too compassionate, hence, well, so glad we had the authors uh, of the book, When Helping Hurts. All of you, are, you bought into the book, you, you get the principles. We are so compassionate in the fact that sometimes this hurt people. Whereas this generation, they are, for the most part, they are not compassionate, they're compassionate. What I mean by that is they, they don't have, you guys just stood up, I love you, please know that. <laughs> In fact, it, it, for the residents here on the front row who know me, they know I've given uh, all of my adult life to this age group because I care and I believe in them. But I'm very concerned about the ability of holistic missions to pass on the baton, so send I you to another generation, and here's precisely why. This generation is compassionate, meaning that they don't necessarily love the other person. They love the reputation of being a compassionate person. How do I know that? How about the, here's an illustration, Tom's shoes. Oh, I, I wear Tom's shoes. That's why you know that I, I care about the plight of the poor. Tom's shoes is not gonna eradicate poverty. Now, I'm glad they're doing what they're doing. Don't, I'm, not, I'm just bashing them. Okay, I'll bash another one. I face. Have you heard about this? Any of you familiar with iFace? Just raise your hand. Oh, you should be. You've got to Google this because it will prove how compassionate you are. You go to iFace and you can buy a watch and you pick the color of your watch based upon what kind of compassionate uh, thing you want to support. If you get a pink watch, that means you are, you are raising awareness of breast cancer. You get a blue watch, and you're raising the awareness of, uh, of clean water. You get a red watch or a white watch, and you're showing by wearing the watch how, how concerned you are about the poor. Now, here's the problem that we're actually encountering, and I need to tell you a, a parable, uh, and we're going to go to the next slide with this, because the danger of this generation is, is actually a biological challenge for millennials. God gave us four chemicals in our body. Now, I'm not a medical doctor. Don't even play what on TV. So I, I'm going to have to oversimplify this, not for you, but for me. So the doctors in the house, I apologize. But God gave us four chemicals. Two of them drive our productivity. And two of them drive our instinct for protection. So here's the parable. Uh, the the uh, cavemen go out on the Serengeti. I don't know if they're really cavemen on the Serengeti, but play along with me. They get hungry and they decide, let's go kill an antelope to eat. So God gives them chemicals from the start to finish of the hunt to make sure it's successful. So the first chemical is they go out and somebody spots an antelope. And, and because that behavior is going to uh, help the tribe survive, God gives them a shot of a chemical called dopamine. It feels really good. It is, in fact, addictive. This generation is terribly addicted to dopamine. And so th this guy who spots the antelope gets a shot. It's a temporary shot, but man, does it feel good. Well, now they have to actually start chasing the antelope. So they start running. You cannot outrun an antelope but you can run out an antelope. So they run and they run and they run and they run and God gives them another chemical to reward the behavior that will sustain the tribe and that is an endorphin. It's a runner's high. So they're running and running and running. They finally catch up. The antelope drops to the ground and says to them, you guys are unbelievable and submits his life. They, one guy kills it with a spear, maybe two. And what keeps the one guy, the biggest guy there, from dragging the antelope off, spearing the other men, and surviving himself. It is a chemical, it's a short, short life chemical called serotonin. 
It is the belonging chemicals, the high five chemical. That you get it and you know, you high five, it feels good, and then you go on, it dissipates rather quickly. But the celebration of killing the antelope uh, allows them serotonin release, and they all feel good about it. Then they go home to their uh, cave wives and cave children, and they cook the antelope to eat. And as they spread out over the table, and they uh, touch one another, they hug one another, the, the embrace chemical is oxytocin. It's a wonderful chemical. It's a romance chemical. But it's also, it's also the community and family chemical that keeps us together. The first two chemicals drive us to produce. The second two drive us to protect. The problem with the modern age, and particularly the millennial generation, is the world they've grown up in has created an addiction to to the dopamine and serotonin. But they are lacking in their ability for endorphins and oxytocin. If it takes too long, they're not going to buy into it. So you've got um, a Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. There's literal chemical addictions to those devices because every time you get a shot of dopamine from them, you get a like on your Instagram. You go, oh, I like that like. They're not just liking it emotionally. There's actually a chemical response in their bodies. Because of video games, which are dopamine-laden, And because of the Instagram and Facebook, which is serotonin-laden, we have trained ourselves as a younger generation to become chemically addicted to those short-term bursts. And we have a generation that is in danger of not being able to carry out a long-term ministry. And you of all people know that holistic ministry requires people with guts and grit who can do what's right over a long period of time with very little reward in the meantime. If you don't train your protégés in endorphins and in oxytocin, that is, if you allow them to have a thousand friends on Facebook but not really engage people who are in their circle of friends that they can touch and do life with in a real way, you will endanger the future of your ministry. What I'm saying is simple. We know what it means when Jesus said, so send I you. But if you are not as shrewd as holistic ministries in figuring out what this generation of millennials needs to have healthy and enduring, sustainable ministries, then all the progress you made, all the fights, the battles that you've won up to now will end with you. I pray to God that we figure out how to give this next generation the long-lasting grit of the endorphins and the real relationships of oxytocin. Then we will be able to say to them, so send I you.